broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Now, the topic that's been in the news this week is Australia's current drought. Uh, Scott Morrison has faced pressure from all sides of politics, including uh, his own, to uh, better assist farmers who are struggling during this time. Australia's uh, dirt and soil, it's always uh, been tough for agriculturists. We've long been called the land of drought and flooding rains, but this current drought is not simply due to what is called uh, uh, cyclical rainfall deficiency, or even more absurdly due to climate change. This is actually a man-made drought caused by government policy and bureaucratic uh, mismanagement. So it stems back fr from the 2007 Federal Water Act and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, a dissenting voice to uh, these policies at the time, who we need to listen to more than ever now is uh, Ron Pike. He's a water consultant and a third generation uh, irrigation farmer. He's made countless uh, radio and alt media appearances, including on my colleague uh, Steel Archer's uh, detonation program. He's also written for Quadrant Online. I'm pleased to speak with him uh, tonight. So myself and the, the rest of you can uh, lo learn the truth about this current drought. Ron, welcome. Thank you, Tim. Delighted to be with you. Now, the Murray-Darling Basin, it's its talked about uh, in the, the news, well, uh, not just this week, but uh, f uh, all throughout the year, this has been an accumulation of uh, scrutiny on uh, the mismanagement of the, the basin. But for those who don't know uh, what is the the actual Murray Darling Basin? I'm just going to show them a, a map. So it's a it's a system of of rivers, and it goes through four states: so Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and South Australia. So it's a very important uh, river uh, system uh, for our our farmers on the the southeast coast. Yes, that is correct, Tim. Uh, it is one of the biggest um, drainage systems in the world. Uh, all of those rivers flow through some of the most fertile uh, farming land in the world. And the great thing about that is the whole system, the whole million square kilometres of it is in a Mediterranean climate. And that is what makes it ideal for the growing of basic food crops. And it's why up until recently, that whole area was not just Australia's food bowl, it was a food bowl for over 40 million people. Um, and look what's happened in the last two or three years. It's gone from uh, a food bowl that people came from all over the world to look at, uh, totally vertigo in, um, vertically integrated industries that produced top quality food and delivered it straight onto the supermarket shelves, not only of Australia, but of the much a larger area across Asia in the last three years that has all been almost destroyed. It is a crime against humanity. It is a crime against the people of Australia and the politicians that are allowing it to continue are an absolute disgrace. Yeah, it's a national tragedy for sure. And well, e ever since uh, European settlement happened, uh, farmers have been there generation to generation. Uh, parents uh, handed their farms over to the children, but we're seeing increasingly, increasingly, especially in this social media age, uh, teary uh, farmers uh, making videos on Facebook just saying we we can't, we have to end this uh, generations old family tradition, and it just breaks your heart. Look, it's shocking what's happened. Um, the, we, Australia is not short of water. Uh, I have been through this many, many, many times. There's 290 million megalitres of water runs off the Australian continent every year. Of that, we use less than 3%. The claim that the Murray uh, system is overcommitted is the greatest load of rubbish that was ever put up. And of course, who fostered it? Malcolm Turnbull. People don't understand that the Murray River is still the biggest river in Australia when it comes to the quantum of water delivered to the sea. Uh, people talk about the Clarence and the um, other Burdekin rivers up north. The Murray delivers more than double the water of the Clarence to the sea every year. And what have we got at the moment? 
from southern Queensland all the way through to southern Victoria, we have farmers with no water for irrigated cropping. And yet, while that's happening, there's something in the order of 30 or 40,000 megalitres of water every single day running into the sea out the mouth of the Murray. Now, the mouth of the Murray, by the way, is not where the Murray-Darling Basin Authority claim it to be. The mouth of the Murray is at Wellington, where it's been for the last several thousand years and likely to be for the next several thousand years. What they're talking about keeping open is an estuarine opening to the sea, and whether it's open or closed or half closed is irrelevant to anything. But what are we doing? We are wasting seven to eight million megalitres of fresh water every year, according to the Murray-Darling Basin, to keep the mouth of the Murray open. It is a scandal beyond belief. You mentioned uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, then. Uh, obviously, uh, people only remember his recent uh, stint as, as Prime Minister, but his first uh, episode of grave political mismanagement was when John Howard made him Assistant Minister for Water and then he became Environment and, and Water Minister. And that was uh, during the, the 2000s a drought uh, when probably climate change was at its peak hysteria. People think that the the climate uh, uh, extinction rebellion protesters are being uh hysterical but uh, they're actually alienating uh, most most of the the public but around 2006 2007 is when the uh, i'd say the majority of the population believed that uh, irreversible climate change was here and the the drought uh, was a an indication of that and uh, also, Malcolm Turnbull, he was, well, he called himself an environmentalist. He was an adherent of uh, the climate change, man-made climate change uh, belief. So it was a perfect storm for the, for, for this, we'd call it a, for the, allegedly for the Environment uh, Water Act and Murray-Darling Basin Plan. With respect, Tim, I don't agree with any of that. Uh, I don't believe the average person in Australia thought that at all. Um, the Australian people since um, 1788 have dealt with drought and we're all well aware that, that Australia is a land of drought and flooding rains. And if we look at the Bureau of Meteorology uh, history of uh, rainfall in southern Australia, what we find is it is actually going up. Um, that took a bit of a dent in the millennium drought. But look, what I would like to do before we go any further is sort out this nonsense about the current drought versus the millennium drought. The millennium drought lasted for 11 years, from 1999 to 2010. During that 11 years, none of our dams uh, ran empty, none of our rivers were dry, we maintain water for the whole length of all of our rivers in sufficient volume to supply all stock and domestic and municipal needs. We had sufficient water to keep all of our permanent plantings, that's fruit trees, grapevines and the like, alive. At the end of that drought, there was still sufficient water in storage that even if it didn't rain for another three years, no one would have run out of water. Compare that to what's happened this time. With the exception of a little bit of area in Queensland that has been in drought for six or seven years, and I want to stress that that area is not really in the catchment of the Murray-Darling Basin. And I also want to stress this. Of all the catchment of the Murray-Darling Basin, what comes out of Queensland is less than 4%. So it's pretty much irrelevant. This drought is only one and a half years old. And in the southern Murray-Darling Basin, it's not even in drought yet. And yet here we have five empty dams. We have six dry rivers. We have municipalities, serious municipalities with no running water. All of the permanent plantings along the Darling and around Melindy Lakes, and this is where we used to produce some of our prime table grapes, our early cherries, our early apricots, they are all dead. Now this has happened in one and a half years of drought. So what's the difference between 
the millennium drought which lasted for 11 years and this drought which is only one and a half years old. The difference is the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has come into place and all of our water has been squandered to the sea by clowns who wouldn't, they couldn't run a bathtub, let alone manage the Murray-Darling Basin. It is an absolute disgrace that the politicians of this country, both federal and New South Wales, are allowing this to continue. And I can absolutely guarantee you that unless they fix it and fix it in the next couple of weeks, they will be swept from office with an absolute passion. And that was also the beginning of the, the attacks on, on, well, it was an attack on, on farmers, the, the Water Act and the, the Murray-Darling uh, Basin Plan, because uh, there were allegations of, of overuse and that needed to be uh, policed. And the, the, it also took away the, the water rights uh, from the, the farmers uh, themselves and created, I've, I've re researched this and it's still difficult to understand the, the, the water market that's being created now. It's almost like a speculative stock market now. It's not a water market. It's a contrived um, system designed for speculators and profiteers to make a profit on a commodity that should never ever be treated as a commodity. The right to water or well, the people's right to water was established in Magna Carta 1200 years ago, sorry, 800 years ago. Uh, it's enshrined in section 100 of the Australian constitution. Malcolm Turnbull blatantly sidestepped section 100 of the Australian constitution. And on that grounds alone, the Federal Water Act should be repealed tomorrow. What happened when he did that is the basis of this whole problem. For the first time ever, we broke the nexus between a license to irrigate and land that could be irrigated. And when you stop and think about it, what other purpose is there for a license to irrigate? It is a license to irrigate land that can be irrigated. Now, once you break that nexus, you create a situation where people can buy so-called water rights they can store them and they can play the so-called market with it, which is what's happening at the moment. And farmers can't afford to buy water. Um, but the worst thing of the whole lot when they did that, the biggest holder of water rights in Australia at the moment is the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. Now, I ask you, what are they doing with that water? I can tell you they are flushing it to the sea to waste. Now, since when has the environment, in inverted commas, uniquely existed down the mouth of the Murray? Now, some of that water has been diverted onto red gum forests. That is the most stupid thing you could ever possibly imagine. Red gums are flood tolerant. They're not flood dependent. They never have been. I can take you and show you vast areas of river red gums that have never seen a flood. Um, and for the Commonwealth environmental water holder to be artificially watering red gums as they are at the moment, when we are in a drought and the people have no water to produce crops, once again, it is a crime against the people. And um, so I've had numerous uh, correspondence with David Littleproud over the last several or eight weeks and I uh, commend him for at least answering my correspondence. Um, but I will not comment here on the veracity of the answers. <laughs> um, we have a minister who is totally out of his uh, depth, pun intended, uh, when it comes to water. And unless the Federal Water Act is repealed and replaced with the plan that I have with the Prime Minister at the moment, um, I don't know what's going to happen. But what I do know is uh, all of those communities that I call my um, birthplace and homeland and all of those communities that have produced our food over the last hundred years, they're all going to be dead by the new year. Um, they, they can't exist for another year of no crop production. And um, you might ask, well, you might say, well, there's no water left there. Well, I'm sorry, uh, there is. 
there's no water left in the Darling system and we can't fix that until it rains again. But there's considerable amounts of water left in the, the Loch of the Murrumbidgee, the Murray and the Goulburn rivers, which are the heart of the food bowl. Um, but what's the government doing with it? It's flushing it to the sea, for goodness sake. Now, if I cannot get a positive response from Prime Minister Morrison in the next few days, um, I won't only be on this program, I'll be on Alan Jones and a number of others and be calling for his resignation. Because um, you can't put yourself in the position of being Prime Minister and then totally disregard the rights of your constituents. And there's no greater right that the people have than the right to a consistent supply of water, power and gas. And this government has denied them that. I think uh, Alan Jones uh, would probably uh, agree with you if you m made that call. I mean, he's he had a fiery interview with, with Scott Morrison earlier in the week where it seemed that Scott Morrison was just repeating the, the talking points. He'd, he, he'd rehearsed them. And people think of Alan Jones as just a, a liberal cheerleader. But if if, if they're not doing the, the right thing by... Uh, any uh, group of people, especially the, uh, the the farmers, he'll 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 go at them. I mean, his biggest target uh, over the past decade was the LNP premier uh, Campbell Newman, and so he's been hammering this uh, all uh, th throughout the week. And it's important that because it's been the the Liberal National Coalition that's been in the the, the federal government for like there was Labor in charge. Uh, basically beginning of 2008 to, to 2013, but we've had the, the National Party hold the agriculture and water portfolio, uh, Barnaby Joyce, uh, and then David Littleproud, and now Agriculture Minister is, is Bridget McKenzie. So they can't just blame the inner city lefty environmentalist greenies, they've been at the helm. Now the National Party have become not the party of regional Australia, they've become the party of let's look after my job by cozying up to the city Liberals because they've got the power. And that, again, is a disgrace. We, we have a Deputy Prime Minister at the moment who I know very, very well, I've known him for 20 odd years. Um, and uh, I'll quite happily say right here and now, he is an absolute fraud when it comes to representing regional Australia. Um, he's a closet greenie. And um, he's up there saying, oh, we're going to build dams in New South Wales. He said it about five or six times in the last few days. Guess what? It's a straight out lie. They are building no dams in New South Wales. They are rebuilding one that exists and they're raising the wall height on Wyangla Dam. And as I quite succinctly said the other day, if you had a list of water infrastructure projects that are needed in New South Wales, the raising of the dam wall on Wyangla would be about number 53. Um, it's certainly not in the first two or three. Now, we've got the similar thing, and I saw um, Melinda Pathy trying to airbrush her brilliant political career on uh, Channel 10 about an hour ago. Um, Sydney's going to run out of water if this drought continues. Are they doing anything about that? No, nothing. Um, Melinda Pavey's out there saying, oh, what a wonderful job they're doing. The people are using less water in Sydney. Well, I've got news for you, Melinda. Um, they're still going to use water. We're down to a million megalitres left in um, the dam. And um, if the drought continues for another two years, where's Sydney going to get us drinking water from? The plans for Sydney's future water we put to the government six years ago. It hasn't been acted on. And until it's acted on, Sydney is in, or could be, in real trouble. But that's another uh, trend over the past, well, 15 uh, years, where uh, it was, we had during the 2000s wall to war Labor state governments, and they all agreed with the environmental activists that we shouldn't build new dams and that we should instead build desalination plants, which cost billions of dollars. And if we're trying to fight climate change and conserve energy they're they're uh, s some of the biggest uh, energy uh, consumers desalination plants of of any sort of uh, type of 
plant uh, or factory? Look, the bottom line, Tim, is, is this. Um, Bob Carr correctly described it. He did a fact-finding tour to the Middle East when he was Premier, um, talking, uh, looking at desalination. When he came home, he got off the plane, he held a press conference, and he said, I've come to the conclusion that desalinated water is simply bottled electricity. Bob Carr said that. He was absolutely correct. Now, if Sydney has to uh, crank up the desalination plant sometime in the next 12 months or so, guess what? There's not going to be enough power to run the thing. We already have Snowy Hydro almost empty. It's down to under 30%. Uh, luckily, there's been a good snow season and there's a bit of running at the moment. But the only way we keep the lights on in Sydney and Melbourne every evening from 4.30 to about 11 o'clock is to run all of those hydroelectric um, generators at full blast. What's that doing? It's emptying the system of water. Um, under the agreement with Snowy Hydro and the states, Snowy Hydro is supposed to deliver approximately 1.1 million megalitres a year into the Murrumbidgee and 1.1 million megalitres a year into the Murray. Have a guess how much water is left in the whole system? About 1.2 million megalitres. Guess where there's going to be no water um, this summer? It won't be coming out of Snowy Hydro and if it's not coming out of Snowy Hydro, you know what's going to happen? The lights will go out in Sydney and Melbourne. And what have we got? We've got government ministers who have been made aware of this and they just sit there on their hands and no decisions to fix this are being made. And if you think it's uh, a difficult place to be being prime minister and a senior minister when people run out of water, how bad is it going to be when they run out of water and power as well? Um, I wouldn't like to be in parliament, frankly. Yes, water and power, they go hand in hand. I mean, uh, farmers, they, they need both access to uh, cheap and efficient uh, electricity and water as well to uh, uh, to grow their, their crop or, 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 or feed their, uh, their cattle, whatever type of uh, farming uh, they're in. And so the, the energy crisis is, is linked to the water crisis as well. Absolutely agree. As I, if you read my work, I've been saying this now for six or seven years. It's what I call the tools of trade of production. And it matters not whether it's primary production or secondary production or manufacturing industry. Every producer has to have power, water, gas and fuel. The fifth one, of course, is labour. Well, we're not short of labour. But both state and federal governments have made those basic inputs of production scarce, expensive and uh, priced our wonderful adaptive and productive producers, they've priced them out of business. And a classic example, and I applaud what both Alan Jones and uh, Pauline Hanson have had to say about the dairy industry, but I also would like to alert them to this. It's not the price of milk that's put the dairy farmers out of business. It's the price of the inputs to produce that milk that's put them out of business. When you've got to pay four or five hundred or six or seven hundred dollars a megalitre for water, when you've got the dearest electricity in the world, and we now have, and gas, we're the second biggest gas producer in the world, but we've got the highest gas prices in the world. Now, surely someone should get hold of um, both the minister and the prime minister by the scruff of the neck and say, how can you justify this nonsense? Because that's what's putting um, dairy farmers out of business. The washed potato industry in Southern Australia is already gone and it's gone for the same reason. The corn industry is gone and I used to be part of that industry and very proud producer of corn that's used in all of our processed foods. The rice industry in Australia was the most productive and efficient rice industry in the world. And it was that way for over 60 years. My uh, paternal grandfather was one of five or six people that grew the first um, 
production of rice in Australia. We used to produce one and a half million tonnes of paddy rice a year. You know how much we produced last year? 50,000 tonnes. Can you imagine how many people have been put out of work as a result of that? And yet we've got a Prime Minister sitting there, we've got a Minister for Water, David Littleproud, sitting there saying, oh, we have to let this Murray-Darling Basin plan uh, continue. Um, you know, it's going to do the right thing one day. Well, I'm sorry, guys. It's blatantly obvious it hasn't succeeded. It's wrecked the whole economy uh, and there's no water left. Um, so guess what? Either it goes or you guys go. It's pretty simple. Uh, still, all the conversation this week is about uh, drought uh, assistance because there's been uh, drought assistance uh, for, for over a decade. There was a another uh, drought uh, in the, the early uh, tw uh, 2010s. Uh, but uh, now there, there's going to be a because it's 250 a week. Uh, it's been quoted the the drought assistance, but now Scott Morrison is issuing a thirteen thousand uh, dollar lump sum. But no, they're not talking about what you're talking about. They they haven't mentioned we're going to review the the Murray Darling Basin uh, plan. Uh, Scott Morrison's talked about an A Triple C investigation into the the water market, which doesn't report until well into 2020, which th there's not enough time. Morris will be gone long before then, unless he corrects this. He's, he's really only got two weeks to fix this. I have put on his desk the plan that will fix it, and I'll come back to the drought assistance in a minute. There is no other way. We can manage our water in a fashion where everyone can have all the water they need and the environment which uh, I very quickly would like to point out, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority have never defined where it is or where it resides or what it is or anything. They just assume that flushing water down the Murray to the sea is somehow beneficial to the environment. Now back to uh, drought assistance. Once you get to the stage where we are now, where we have a large section of Australia in drought and nothing's been done before, there's really nothing the government can do other than hand out money. It can hand out money to keep um, people in, in food and supplies. It can hand out money to some extent to buy feed for livestock. But what you need to remember is by the time an official drought declaration is made, most of the reserves of fodder uh, have been already used because no one can ever tell us when a dry spell becomes a drought until afterwards. Um, with the hindsight of history, we can say, oh yeah, that dry spell became a drought back in April last year. So there's nothing Morrison can do, and I certainly don't uh, blame him uh, for this, probably uh, contrary to Alan Jones, who's I consider a mate of mine, um, other than hand out money. But the plan that I put to the government, I put it recently uh, to this government, I put it to the government when the drought broke in 2010. We can drought proof the whole of Australia and it's got two arms. The first arm is water. We have to conserve water in Australia in every single valley in the country. And I mean every valley. Every valley goes through periods of vast floods, which cause a lot of damage and they are invariably followed by periods when there's no flow. So how simple is it to build some water storage, avoid the damage of floods, and ensure that, that people in the whole valley have got water for the, right through the dry periods? The second thing we have to do, we have to set up a national drought fodder reserve. Initially, the government would have to put up some money for that, we establish those drought fodder reserves at existing grain storage facilities, which you see all over regional Australia, wherever we produce grain. The government would need to build some new silos and some new hay sheds. But we stopped that drought reserve in years of plenty. The Egyptians taught us this 3,000 years ago. Um, you don't go out and try and buy the fodder, which is what's happening now during the drought you buy the fodder and store it in times of plenty. 
Now, when we have big grain years, that's winter grain crop years, um, it often happens that come harvest time, you'll get thunderstorms or something, and a lot of the crop gets downgraded to feed grade. That, and people have trouble selling it. That is the grain that the government buys to establish this um, stock fodder reserve. But it won't cost the government any money at all once it's established, because what we would do is put a livestock levy per head across every head of livestock in the country. Uh, and it wouldn't be much, but it'd be very little. And that would perpetuate um, the maintaining of that uh, stock reserve, sorry, fodder reserve. Farmers could not get access to it while there was a dry spell on. They'd still be responsible for maintaining their own uh, hay and grain reserves. But once a drought was declared, they could get access to that fodder at no cost. And that's the biggest problem in a drought. By the time the farmer needs um, reserves of fodder, he's got no money. He's got no income. By doing it this way, he doesn't need an income. It's already been paid for. It was paid for through the good years. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I'm sure you've tabled this to the, the ministers and other uh, people that you've met. And so they've got this in front of them, uh, but they're still business as usual. That's why I'm so depressed at the moment. Um, it's um, the problems we face in Australia. The, the upside is they're fixable. Yes. We're, not, we're, we're, we're the most resource rich country in the world. So why in the hell have we got the dearest power in the world? Why are we short of water? I've just demonstrated. We don't use 3% of our available water resources. And that's without mentioning, by the way, groundwater. We have more groundwater in Australia than most other countries on earth. And down where I come from in the Western Riverina and the Murrumbidgee Valley is the biggest potable water aquifer in the world. It is 2 billion. These are not my figures. This is New South Wales Office of Water figures. 2 billion megalitres of water there. Now, here we are in a drought with the New South Wales Office of Water saying, oh, you can't use that water. Oh, no, you know, you can't use that. Um, we are currently governed by and managed by a, uh, a governing class that are only interested in their own future. And they are not operating in the interests of the Australian people. And frankly, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we should um, cast most of them into the river. <laughs> They've basically socialised the, the, the water uh, in Australia, you mentioned that it's the federal government that now owns most of the water. And anyone who knows the history of socialism and communism, when the government's in charge of something that's centrally controlled, then there's mismanagement and there's rationing as well. And if you're accused of hoarding, hoarding or stealing uh, water, uh, then the uh, they come after you, the, the government. There's there's something called the Northern Basin uh, Commissioner, whose job it is to uh, police uh, overuse, which is uh, Mick Kelty at the moment, who used to be the Australian Federal That's Police what, Commissioner. Yeah. So th th that shows you that how, how, how sort of making sure that uh, nobody uh, goes over their, their allocation, because rationing is, it's it happens in communist countries. Look, it's a totalitarian state we live in in New South Wales, and it's time the people rose up and said, we're not going to cop this anymore. Um, I'll give you an example of just how bad it's got, and it relates to water. When um, the state decided to build Burrinjuk Dam, which was in the middle of the Federation drought in 1898, they didn't start building it until four or five years later. But they very correctly went ahead and said, well, right, if we're going to build this dam, we then have to organise um, how we use the water. They built uh, Barren Bed Weir, they dug the main canal, and they bought Sir Samuel McCackie's North Yanko. Um, the organisation that was set up to do all of that 
uh, and it was set up in 1914. Uh, no, sorry, before then. Anyway, it doesn't matter. About 1910. Was the New South Wales Water Conservation and Irrigation Commission, um, warmly known as the WC and IC. That one bureaucracy ran all the water in New South Wales for well over 90 years. They built dams, they built weirs, they dug channels, they supplied water to Sydney and supplied water to everybody. There was one organisation. In the last few years, we've gone from one bureaucracy managing water for the whole of the state to anything up to seven or eight bureaucracies in every single valley. Have you got that? Yes. The number of bureaucracies is in the, I don't know, it's in in the dozens and dozens and dozens. All that... of those bureaucracies are employing people who expect to get paid from the sale of a dwindling amount of water because they're wasting it. And so why do you think there's problems out there? Uh, if we took the machete to three quarters of the bureaucrats managing water in New South Wales, two things would happen. The first is the management of water would improve overnight. And the second thing is there'd be plenty of water for the people. Um, it's, 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 it's ludicrous what's going on. You wonder with all those bureaucrats and the, the billions that has been spent on managing the, the Murray-Darling Basin, where's all the money going? What are all those bureaucrats doing what do they do from from nine to five other than making sure that farmers don't get water but i want to uh, just uh, touch on briefly because you've talked about how most a lot of this water uh, that's in the the basin is being flushed out to ocean in form of environmental flows can you explain the if there is any logic behind it and also the the rationale behind not building any new dams as well look the answer to the first question is it's nothing more than bloody-minded stupidity um it's there is nothing there is no environmental advantage in putting more water down a river than it is required to maintain all of stream flow in sufficient quantity quantity to meet extraction amounts and those extraction amounts are for stock of domestic and municipalities and permanent plantings and if there's any left over uh, we give an allocation to annual croppers that's how we managed the system for 90 odd years and we got it right um, the there is no such thing as an environmental flow the way we've seen down the Murray now for the last nine months. On average, there has been 12 to 14,000 megalitres of water released out of Hume Dam every single day into an already swollen river with uh, runoff from the uh, snow melt. All of that water has gone to the sea to waste. And the authorities have for the last three or four years, um, very, very falsely and deceptively, um, changed the way they uh, report the river flows down river. Uh, I can assure you, if you go onto the um, uh, website of South Australian Water, you will see there the amount of water flowing through each of the weirs down through South Australia all of those volumetric figures that appear every uh, week are fabricated. Uh, why are they fabricated? Because they are embarrassed or would be embarrassed if it was shown the real amount of water that's just flowing out to sea. And um, I repeat right where we started out. This either has to stop within the next two weeks or the Morrison government the New South Wales government and probably the Victorian government are going to be washed away with the uh, reaction of what's happened. And um, once again, pun intended. It's just so unbelievable that well, there's been successful agricultural production in uh, the Australian continent for, for 200 years. And in just the 21st century, it's just been completely ruined just because of miss uh, ideological 
stupidity, uh, as you call it, uh, adherence to uh, quacko uh, theories, how it's, yeah. ju it's just all been... And yeah, you saw uh, Alan Jones uh, tear up on, on Sky News on Tuesday night, just listening to you, I'm getting quite emotional because it's just, how could this happen? And uh, Peter Credlin, who he hosts uh, his Sky News show with, she's the daughter of a, a dairy farmer as well, so it's uh, close to home, sir, as well. And we also saw Pauline Hansen uh, tear up on, on 2GB with Ellen Jones this morning because it's the, the dairy farmers, uh, they're another one that's uh, struggling. Her idea is to re-regulate the the, the dairy industry. That's also what uh, Bob Catter, the, the independent member for Kennedy, has been lobbying for. And it all uh, it's all related to this uh, the price of milk wars because uh, the, the major supermarkets, they, they introduced dollar litre of uh, uh, milk. It's, it's slowly gone uh, back up and it's obviously people are wanting more to go back to the, the dairy farmers. But what's the guts of, of that problem? Is it what, what was the deregulation of the, the dairy industry? Look, there was no problem with the deregulation of the dairy industry. There would still be no problem with um, the dairy industry if, as I said earlier, uh, we can argue that, um, you know, the supermarkets and that drive a hard bargain for milk, but it's actually not the supermarkets, it's the processors that um, set the price of milk that farmers get. Um, of course, they've got to deal with the end user, which is the supermarkets. But the problem with the dairy industry is, and I did mention this earlier, it's not the price of milk. It's the price of the inputs of production. And once you get water at hundreds of dollars a megalitre, when for the last, well, ever since we've had volumetric uh, allocations, the price per megalitre of water for broadacre irrigation is usually 30 to $35. Once that goes from $35 to four or five or six or seven or 800, how can a dairy farmer exist? Now, while that's been going on, his power bill that used to be uh, four or five hundred dollars a month is now five or ten thousand dollars a month. His power bill. Uh, if he uses gas, which quite a lot of them do, we've got the dearest gas in the world. And do not lose sight of the fact how important this is. The whole of Australia runs on diesel fuel. Um, outside of a few electric trains in the centre of the major cities, all of our transport, all of our agriculture, all of our fishing, all of our forestry, all of our mining, it runs on diesel. Guess what? We don't even produce diesel in this country anymore. We are on a short fuse where if a boat got turned around or sunk or something in um, between here and Asia, we would run out of fuel in less than a week. We have all these vast reserves of brown coal and, um, you know, coal that's probably not um, first quality, out of which we can produce diesel. We should have started that program 25 years ago. But here we are today in 2019 with something like a week's supply of diesel. Can you imagine what's going to happen if we ran out of diesel in view of what I've just said? Um, now, that also affects the dairy industry because dairy farmers, like every other farmer, all their tractors run on diesel. And I just go back to the point, both our federal and our state governments have let the people down. They both need to take stock of what their job is and their job is looking after the Australian people. It's not grandstanding behind the footlights of the world stage. Um, Come home, stay in Australia, and start managing the country the way you should. Yes, other uh, experts in the area have talked about uh, fuel security, how uh, given that we are so dependent on, on overseas now that we could potentially run uh, out of, of fuel. And uh, energy, it's not, it's not just uh, affecting the uh, farming sector, but it's one of the reasons why we don't have a manufacturing industry anymore. That was most obvious with the closure of all the, the car manufacturers in Adelaide. Obviously, f well, 
everyone in the supermarket still wants to buy local produce and and products uh but uh, but uh, this is going to be the next thing that uh that goes and it'll definitely be more visible tim we've become by the neglect of government in planning for the future has resulted in an economy in australia which is made up of bureaucracies and service industries. We no longer manufacture much at all, on, and it's underpinned, of course, by the mining industry. Uh, if it wasn't for mining industry um, uh, payments to state governments in particular, they'd all be broke. And what it's got to is this. You can walk into any shopping centre anywhere in Australia. You can buy quite a good soy latte. You can buy something to eat to go with it. But guess what? We can't make the machine that makes a soy latte. We don't even make the refrigerator to keep the milk cold anymore. Would you believe we import refrigerators from New Zealand? Yeah, I can believe that. Now, who would have ever thought, I, I'll accept that the Kiwis can always beat us at rugby, but I don't accept that they should beat us at every other thing. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, I've got a very warm spot for the Kiwis, by the way, but um, the our whole economy is on the verge of collapse. We are headed into probably the deepest recession that Australia has ever seen. And the result of that is going to be a dramatic drop in the standard of living for every Australian. Now, that's not where we want to go. But I'm sorry, Prime Minister, and I'm sorry, uh, Treasurer Frydenberg, that is where you have taken us. And I go back to what I said. You've taken us there because you've taken away from the people the tools of trade. Now, if you fix that, we might even avoid this recession. But if you don't, that's where we're headed. The urbanisation of Australia, that uh, hasn't helped the, the voice uh, of the farmers, and that's why the Liberals and Nationals, even though they, they, they talk a big game about, uh, of course, we respect the, the farmers, you've just exposed how they've uh, neglected them. But uh, the people in the bush, uh, they, are, they, they still do have a, an electoral uh, voice. In New South Wales, where the, the drought is, is at its most uh, desperate level they've uh, in southern uh, New South Wales uh, in the the seats uh, which take in the, the Murray Darling Basin they've uh, started to elect uh, shooters fishers and farmers party uh, MPs probably one of the best voices on the the Murray Murray Darling mismanagement is uh, Helen Dalton. She's the member for Murray. There's also Roy uh, Butler, the the member for Barwon. There's three uh, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party MPs in the, the lower house. There's two rural uh, in independents. Uh, that uh, hasn't been replicated at a federal level yet, uh, but there is a, a bush revolt happening. Look, absolutely. And um, I'd just like to note, Helen Dalton made her decision to enter politics sitting alongside her husband, Nace, um, at a table about 10 feet from where I am now. Oh, uh, wow. So I've known Helen Dalton for a great deal of time. She is like a breath of fresh air in the um, New South Wales uh, Parliament. Um, she is doing a wonderful job, as are the other SFF uh, members. But I'd like to point out here as well, the uh, effort being put in by Rod Roberts from One Nation in the Upper House and his colleague, Mark Latham, uh, absolutely excellent and to be applauded. And there is absolutely no doubt that come the next federal election, there will be serious uh, people standing against the likes of Susan Lee, um, the likes of Michael McCormick and Barnaby Joyce. If Barnaby Joyce gets back into parliament again, all well, the people are absolutely bloody mad. Um, the, both he and um, uh, McCormick uh, have been frauds to regional Australia. Um, neither of them have ever had one uh, sentence of vision or um, no idea about what is needed to make regional Australia productive again. 
and uh, all they've done is supported all the things that have made it unproductive. Barnaby Joyce stood up there uh, on the Murrumbidgee, banks of the Murrumbidgee alongside Gajildry Weir about four years ago. The Murrumbidgee River, which uh, I lived on for a very large part of my life, was running at about 120,000 megalitres a day. Uh, in other words, running a banker, running over the banks, there was floods. And here's what Barnaby Joyce said. It's absolutely essential that we implement the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and return water to the environment. And of course, the people just booed. Uh, here was this idiot standing alongside a flooded river demanding that we return more water to a flooded river. Like, you know. No. And uh, as I pointed out on the, the map, uh, South Australia uh, has part of the, the Murray-Darling Basin and the, the, the attention to how the, the mismanagement is affecting uh, that state, it's, it's come from what some people would think are unlikely uh, sources. The Centre Alliance, uh, when Nick Xenophon uh, was in federal and state parliament, he gave a lot of attention to this issue and even the, the Greens, Sarah Hanson-Young. Look, South Australia has never been short of water, never, and never ever will be because the multi-state agreement that was put in place in 1914 is still the predominant agreement managing the Murray River. Uh, and that agreement quite simply states that the first priority for water in the Murray will be to maintain all of river flow in sufficient volume to ensure that South Australia gets a minimum of 1,850,000 megalitres a year every year and there's a little proviso except in exceptional circumstances. In 104 years those exceptional circumstances were brought into play once which was in 2007 but they were never ever met in 2007, the worst year of the millennium drought, uh, South Australia still got 2,400,000 megalitres of water. So the claim that South Australia has somehow been denied water is a lie. Well, there you go there. Uh, but uh, of course, it, it seems that, uh, well, South Australia, it's a, a state, well, it's been self it's been self-inflicted its economic uh, uh, decline so you can probably uh, say there that Centre Alliance and well Sarah Hanson Young they're more motivated by uh, uh, interest in their their state which well it's we're a federation so I guess you can't blame them for that well you know if you're going to run your state on the basis that uh, the most important thing and the greatest moral issue is uh, man-made climate change. Well, of course, you're going to end up looking foolish. <laughs> you, know, you don't even have to think about that one. Now, I want to talk about the the, the real-life impact that's happening in, in rural uh, communities, because that's the, the unpleasant uh, aspect to, to talk about. I've talked about uh, rural flight, uh, how the well, the rural electorates are becoming uh, much uh, larger and there's more seats in the, the city, but obviously farmers, uh, mental health, yeah, uh, again, Alan Jones, a lot of them have, have called in and uh, farmers are pretty tough and to like hear them, like, they, they don't break down easily they're, they're they're tough it's tough being on the farm that, that that's how much it's uh, affecting them there's a knock on uh, on rural businesses as well the the person that runs the milk bar in the the rural town the the hotel e e everything's uh, affected and of course it'll eventually affect uh, our food prices in the city and quality of food tim you're absolutely correct the wonderful thing about the Australian food bowl as it was, is that it was totally vertically integrated. The farmers produced the raw product. There were processes and manufacturers and so on that uh, came into play. Um, the product went on to either trains or semi-trailers and it was delivered to supermarkets across Australia and in many cases to supermarkets um, in other parts of the world. All of that is now under threat. I get at least one or two phone calls a day, usually from people I do not know. They are often in tears. Some of them are women 
who are concerned about their men folk. I had one the other day, and this is from a young gentleman I don't know. And you know what he said to me? He's on the Lachlan River, about 50 kilometres downstream of Forbes. And he said, Ron, the reason I'm ringing you is, he said, I've got nowhere else to turn, and I've, I've watched you and listened to what you've had to say for some time. He said, my family has lived on this property for 160 years. He said, we're, we're not big growers, uh, but we're small irrigators. He grows uh, some cotton every year. He grows uh, some alfalfa for hay. He said, I've educated my kids to uh, university education. But he said, one of them wants to come home to the farm. And he said, I can't let him do it because he said, I cannot exist here any longer because over, after 160 years, when they deny me water, and this is what motivated the phone call, Wyangla Dam is down to 19%, which is only about 200,000 megalitres. He said, I've got no water allocation this year, but the Murray-Darling Basin Authority are just releasing 28,000, in other words, more than 10% of the water in the dam, to water some gum trees down below me. Now, with tears in his eyes, or in his voice, he said, Ron, what can you do to help me? And all I could say to him was, mate, I'm doing everything I can, but I can't do any more. Now, I just want to follow that up with what I've been told from the people who are doing similar to what I'm doing down in the Murray. I am told that in the seat of Farah in the last 12 months, there have been 34 suicides but from but all by men. Now, some of them are made to look like accidents. In other words, they get on the motorbike and go tearing down the road 100 mile an hour and run into a tree. That way the family gets the insurance and it's classed as an accident. But the people that are telling me this are telling me that there's been 34 suicides just in the seat of Farah. Now, there's another young gentleman who I won't name, but he runs a suicide prevention uh, network, in fact, in my old hometown. He rings me regularly. He said, Ron, it's become an absolute crisis. Um, he said, the number of men that don't know what to do, they don't want to walk off their farm, but without water, they can't stay on their farm. And he said, I am concerned that we're going to see multiple suicides in the course of the next few months. Now, they're two phone calls that I've received in the last week. Um, and I think that probably answers your question. Yeah, yeah. that's gut-wrenching to, to hear that. And yeah, you've, you've obviously got a lot of contempt for, for Susan Lee. Well, she's the environment minister. Now she's back in. It's, it, it sounds like that... Have you been able to get in contact with her? Because it seems that this is the electorate which is, is most affected by this. Uh, I'll tell you a bit of history. I left the National Party in disgust a few years ago, and what I did, I hopped in the car and went down to the seat of power, and I stood against Susan Lee. So, yes, I know very well. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't succeed. But uh, I was that furious and wild then that um, I'm too old to do it again. But... Um, yeah, I threw my hat in the ring in uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2016. Oh, good on you for, for doing that. Now, whenever there's a scandalous mismanagement of something by government, there's calls for a, a Royal Commission. Uh, Four Corners, they did an episode on the Murray-Darling Basin. It seems that a Four Corners episode, the automatic reaction to that is to hold a Royal Commission. But all that is is just presenting evidence and we've had several royal commissions in the in the past few years and there's hardly been any uh, not many recommendations taken up or a lot of the recommendations have been wrong it just seems to just be a a venting exercise which it does expose to the public what's what's going on but you've already talked about you've got the solutions why why do we need a a royal commission, which is going to take up more taxpayers' money to basi basically say uh, in hearings what you and I both already know. 
Tim, uh, we've had this, uh, it's uh, ironic in one way you're bringing this up tonight because there's been a very, very, um, I won't say heated, but a very uh, robust discussion about a Royal Commission in social media today. Uh, in summary, and I, I think this was ultimately accepted by most people, the calling of a Royal Commission into the Murray-Darling Basin Plan now is strictly a waste of time, money and effort. Um, who do you think is going to draw up the uh, terms of reference? Who's going to select the commissioners? Um, the government and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and um, they're, all they're going to do is come up with something like uh, what happened in the South Australian Royal Commission which was only a few months ago and they'll come out and say oh no the way to fix this is take more water off irrigators. Now as you and I both know those irrigators at the moment have got no water. Um, so that's an absolute waste of time and the issue and I cannot stress this enough the issue is now far, far more critical. If the government doesn't act and fix this in the next week or two, I can tell you what's going to happen. There will be civil unrest. There will be uprisings uh, because look, regional people, you may be able to bend them. You may be able to walk over them and pummel them into the ground. But I've got news for Mr. Little Proud and Melinda Pathy and Scott Morrison. You will never break them. They're tougher than that. They're made of bloody good stuff. A lot better stuff than you bastards are made of. Mm. Uh, and they will rise up and destroy the government before they will allow everything that they and several generations have worked for to be destroyed by a mob of overpaid bloody bureaucrats who shouldn't be there. So Mr. Morrison, start listening. And I just want to stress again, the plan to fix this is sitting on the Prime Minister's desk. It is a plan that doesn't proportion blame. It is a plan that seamlessly moves from that which is costing the government both money and credibility to a plan that will return money to government coffers and return the credibility to the government. I challenge the Prime Minister right here and now to talk to me and let's start implementing this next week because if we don't, as I said, those people that you are treading into the ground at the moment are stronger than you and they will rise up and they will destroy you and your government. And I think most of the, the people who've been watching tonight, myself there, the solution is, or it's quite simple, free the water and trust the farmers to manage it like they, they always have. They've managed it brilliantly for a hundred years. Um, why would anything change? Like, no farmer, no matter who he is, is going to want to use water that isn't available and no farmer's um, going to use water that will deny someone downstream water in spite of what they're saying at the moment about the Darling River. Um, providing the rules are in place the way they were for the last hundred years and if you go online and look at my plan for the Darling River, it's very, very simple. That is the way every river valley in Australia should be managed. And if it's managed that way, we will never, ever be short of water again. Um, it's, the frustrating thing is, the present management system is so bloody complex, so multi-layered, that it can't work. The solution is actually incredibly simple. Mm. And as I said to someone the other day, they say, oh, yeah, but what about the science? And I said, what bloody science? Oh, well, you know, we've got to understand the science. And I said, well, I'll tell you how you understand it. You need a degree from a university in common sense. And then there's only three things you need to know. Water availability in Australia is highly variable. It runs downhill and it finds its own level. Now, how simple is that? They're the only three things you need to know to manage water. You don't need any science. You don't need any of this other nonsense. Um, 
And anyway, the guy said that to laughter. But I will defy anyone, and I don't care if it's a chief scientist from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, anybody else, to challenge me on that. Um, you know, make my day, sunshine, because that's all we need to know to manage water properly. So do we need to build more dams? Well, during the last 40 years, our population has nearly doubled and we haven't built any more water storage. Every other populated um, continent on Earth has been building dams hand over fist. Excuse the uh, expression. I don't like using cliches, but I'm using them tonight. My apologies. Um, except the continent that has the most unreliable uh, rainfall. We're the only continent that hasn't built dams. Um, I can't remember the figures, but I put them in a paper that went to the New South Wales government about five years ago. I think in that paper, I did some research and I found that the World Bank had financed over 500 major dams across the world in the last five or six years, something like that. Guess what? We haven't built one in Australia. None. Yeah, which tells you plenty. Yep. But now, I just be sorry to interrupt him, but I just want to stress I don't, I've got no idea who's listening to this or who'll see it or, or whatever, but please understand I'm being critical of management and politicians, and I'm, I'm well aware of that. But at the end of the day, this is very, very fixable. My job here is to help you fix it. Um, I know I, I haven't been doing this for 50 years without having some knowledge about how the system works. Um, and, you know, I, if I was really truthful, the figure's actually 60 years. <laughs> so um, I was the first person to officially use water from the Snowy Scheme in 1960. And as a result of that, Sir William Hudson invited me up to uh, Cooma and I spent a week as their guest. Um, in going around the scheme uh, with my dad and uh, I've been involved in uh, the management and politics of water ever since um, and it's been a um, it, it's been a labor of, of great love and uh, passion and gratitude but it's also what makes me cry when I see the situation at the moment it's it's just but please please Prime Minister just listen to us. We can fix it. Well, the people watching tonight, they've been in the uh, the, the live chat. They're, they've certainly uh, appreciated what uh, you've uh, got to say. And even if the, the Prime Minister's still not listening, you've still got to tell as many people as possible. Keep doing media, articles, everything. Get the, the message out to as many people as, as possible. Because as you talked about, a revolt, that's the only thing that politicians are, are scared of and I've appreciated you coming on uh, tonight if if people want to uh, get, in, get in contact with you or access uh, your uh, proposals how can they do that go onto my Facebook page is the easiest way um, I'm always available to give people more detail as once I establish who they are and what they're about um, I uh, say here I have had over the last few years a number of people from within politics who have uh, plagiarised uh, some of our work and I want to stress that the Australian Water Exploration Company, a not-for-profit company, have been responsible for doing a lot of the work that uh, I put forward and propose um, and it makes me absolutely bloody sick when I see some two-pit politi politician or political party plagiarise that work. But at the end of the day, the important thing is that we get those plans implemented. And um, hopefully we are much closer to that now. But when you see the Prime Minister and the New South Wales Premier and the Deputy Prime Minister struck the stage only uh, five or six days ago, and effectively lied their head off to the Australian people by saying, oh, we're building dams. 
I challenge them here tonight to name one dam they're building because they're not. Um, the whole thing was um, it was just a charade. Uh, they're rebuilding the Dungowan Dam, which is an existing dam. They're increasing the height of Wyangla, which is a, a bit of a farce. Um, they're not doing, building any dams to make sure that Sydney water supply will be sufficient. Um, Sydney's now a city of 5 million people growing at 200,000 people a year. That necessitates the building of a Burrinjuk sized dam every seven or eight years to keep water up to those people. Um, Melinda Pavey will go down in history as probably the most uh, incompetent water minister that New South Wales has ever seen. And believe me, that is a very big order because uh, we have had a run of incompetent water ministers. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, I, I, I just want to go back and say to the politicians, both state and federal, all of this is fixable. But yeah. it's sure as hell not fixable while ever you are pig-headed enough to think that you've got control. Because you don't. You don't understand what you're talking about. Well, I hope the politicians don't believe that uh, the news cycle will simply move on next week and, and this will, will go away. Uh, I hope that they uh, another thing's coming to them. And, and please, uh, Ron, uh, maintain uh, the rage uh, because... Yeah, it's certainly been one of the more emotional uh, episodes uh, to me. I've grown up in or uh, the the outer uh, suburbs, but yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's it's been a really uh, it's taken a, a it's really touched me this episode. Tim, I thank you for the opportunity. As you know, it's something that's very dear to my heart and has been all of my life, and. Um, and yeah, I get very emotional these days um, because I just can't sit idly by and watch people that I've known virtually from when they were born. Uh, I'll just give you another example. Well, I won't mention names, but this lady rang me uh, yesterday. She has been a real toiler for uh, water reform for 10 or 15 years. I know her and her husband, I've known them, their uh, families before them. And here's what she said to me. She said, Ron, we are out. She said, for the first time in our lives, we can't pay our way. And she said, we can't pay our way because we've got no crops. But you know why they can't pay their way? And this is a crime against the people. They are still being charged by the New South Wales State Water Authorities for water they are not getting. They've been charged for that water now since 2002. The New South Wales State Water Authorities exacted from irrigators 15% of their water entitlement in 2002. They did it on the basis that it was just um, for while the drought was on. Now stop and think about, first of all, how stupid this is. The water they exacted was all owned by the state anyway, but they exacted it and took it off irrigators. So they couldn't, uh, when there was an allocation made, instead of, uh, if they had 100 megalitres of water, from that day on, they only had 85 megalitres of water. But then because they weren't selling any water, or not selling much, they introduced a delivery charge. Now that delivery charge was charged on your water entitlement, regardless of whether you got the water or not. But guess what? They also levied that charge on the water that had been exacted. Now, in my opinion, the New South Wales Minister for Water and the Premier should be in court charged with extortion. Because if that's not extortion, uh, I've never heard of it. But that's what's going on in New South Wales when this woman rang me, who I've known since she was born and knew her mother and dad very, very well, um, she said, Ron, we can't go on. Uh, we've got no income, but we're still up for all this money to give to the New South Wales state government for a product that they cannot deliver. 
Uh, that sounds closing on that note. If that's not abuse of power, I don't know what is. Uh, that seems to me like the final uh, kick in the teeth, or uh, a punch in the guts, or a middle finger. That's uh, after after going through all that they've gone through, the government to say, "Pay up." That's abhorrent. Well, that's what's going on in New South Wales. Uh, to a lesser extent, it's happening in other areas. But in New South Wales, that's been going on now for 16 or 17 years. And a class action against the government, I think, would uh, romp in. Well, like I said, I've appreciated your time. We could probably, oh, if we wanted to, to uh, do a full kangaroo uh, court, uh, we'd probably be going for for hours and hours. But uh, we'll we'll leave it at that tonight. But if there's any further developments, uh, I'd love to have you back on. Tim, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, we have to persist with this, and we have to get it right. And if I could conclude by just saying, please, Prime Minister. Um, and please, uh, Premier, ju just let's sit down and talk about this. We can fix it. Um, but you cannot go on denying people access to what is their basic rights. Uh, too right. All right. Take care. Thanks, Tim. All the best. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.